Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to welcome each of you as we meet for the first IAG meeting of 2023. Before we begin, I'd like to note that the views expressed here are my own, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the FDA's PCAB board or the staff. First, I'd like to thank my co-chair, Amy McGarity. Amy and I share the chair responsibilities for the IAG, and I, for one, am grateful because it will be difficult for one person to keep up with the dedicated and seemingly tireless efforts of the members. I also want to thank members of the IAG for your willingness to devote so much of your time to the work of the PCOB to help advance its mission to protect investors. As Chair Williams says, the heart of our mission is about people, whether it's workers saving for retirement, parents saving to put their kids through college, or anyone who depends on the soundness of our capital markets to invest and build their own version of the American dream. Your work on the IAG helps the PCOB protect those people, and it makes a huge impact. So thank you. As part of this ongoing work to protect investors, members of the IAG formed four subcommittees earlier this year. Today, three of those subcommittees will report. I wanted to th take this opportunity to thank James Andrus, Gina Sanchez, Sandy Rich, and Parveen Gupta for volunteering to lead these subcommittees. We recognize that it takes a lot of time out of your very busy schedules and all the work that you have been doing behind the scenes to make today's program possible is thoroughly valued. Before I turn to today's agenda, I'd like to ask uh, the IAG co-chair, Amy, if she'd like to say a few words. Amy? Thank you. Thanks, Saba. I don't have a lot to say other than to thank um, the members of the IEG as well as the PCOB board for their ongoing commitment to this important um, IEG and the work that we are uh, endeavor to complete. Um, there has been a lot of work done over the last since our last meeting, and I'm grateful for all of that. And Saba, for your uh, dedication and commitment to our uh, positive outcomes and influences on on the investment community. So thank you for that. It's been a pleasure working with you and I'm really looking forward to today's meeting. So I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. To today's agenda, which features an update from my PCOB colleague, Barb Vanich on the PCOB standard setting agenda. Following Barb's presentation, the IAG subcommittee will report to the PCOB on three very important and timely topics. In each case today, relevant subcommittee members have recommended and assembled a group of panelists intended to present a variety of perspective of the topic at hand. I want to thank the panelists and moderators in advance for their participation and contribution. We're eager to hear their perspective and we'll, <clears throat> we'll look forward to the subcommittee's recommendations in the future. With that, I'll now give the floor over to Barb, who will provide an update on what may very well be the most ambitious standard setting agenda in the PCOB's history. Barb, take it away. Thank you, Saba, and uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, I need to provide the disclaimer that my remarks today are my own and not necessarily those of the board, its members, or other PCOB staff. Uh, since the last IAG meeting, as you know, the board issued proposals on our quality control project and on our confirmations project. And I wanna take a minute to thank you for submitting comment letters on both proposals. I know you're all very busy people and we truly appreciate the input. I, we received over 40 comment letters on the QC proposal and also on our confirmations proposal. The team is currently analyzing the letters and we'll be working with the board on next steps. Uh, we are considering reaching out to some commenters, including in the IAG, in order to, to obtain some additional information on comments provided. Uh, since your last meeting, we continue to work very hard with the board on other short-term standard setting projects. Uh, from an ordering perspective, currently, uh, we anticipate making recommendations to the board on AS1000 and NOCLAR. Uh, followed by amendments related to the use of data analysis and, and going concern. By way of review, AS1000 is a project that came out of work done by our interim standards team and encompasses interim standards that are foundational in nature and address very important comment, uh, concepts, including due care and professional skepticism, 
and in general set forth requirements that apply to every audit. We've also started to engage more with the board on some of the midterm projects and by way of review, midterm projects are those for which we don't expect board action in the next 12 months, uh, but the staff are actively working on them. As I've mentioned before, as we make progress, we'll consider when to move midterm projects to the short-term agenda. Since the last IAG meeting, we've made substantial progress on our substantive analytical procedures project. Uh, that project is considering changes to requirements regarding the auditor's use of substantive analytical procedures to better align with the auditor's risk assessment as well as to address the increase in use of technology tools in performing the procedures. Uh, we've continued to do additional outreach and gather information on AS2401, uh, our fraud standard, uh, and we've been thinking about the nexus of the fraud standard uh, and our project on noncompliance with laws and regulations, since the financial statement fraud is an example of noncompliance with laws and regulations. I'm certainly looking forward to the panel today, and I'd like to thank you uh, for taking the time to pull such an illustrious panel together. Uh, based on the initial work completed by our interim standards team, we've also started to assign additional projects to our staff. And in the upcoming months, I'm hopeful that we'll be adding additional projects to, to the agenda when we update the agenda again in the spring and, and later this year in the fall. We also continue to progress our research project on firm and engagement performance metrics. And uh, from a research perspective, uh, just some of the activities our team has been busy with, uh, including analyzing input from our recent discussions with you and our, and our CAG. Uh, we've considered relevant information from comment letters, some of which you provide or, or other investor advocates have provided uh, either through our, our quality control project or the strategic plan. Uh, we've, we've looked at for the top 20 U.S. firms by total revenue, we've reviewed all publicly issued audit quality, transparency, or other reports. Um, each top firm has up to three public reports issued uh, that have different content. Uh, we've also reviewed our internal data requests from firms and, and have spent a lot of time with our colleagues in, in DRI, and I'm always very grateful to get time with our inspectors who, who are very informative. And our colleagues in the Office of Economic and Research Analysis have identified and looked at almost, uh, almost 900 papers, I think it's 889 papers to be exact. So there's a large body of research on this topic. Uh, we've, we've looked at what other countries have, have mandated from a reporting perspective. Uh, for example, the UK, Netherlands, Germany, uh, Switzerland, uh, among others, and we've had a chance to talk with some of our, our colleagues at other regulatory bodies to understand uh, what, how they went about selecting AQIs um, and, and lessons learned, some of the roadblocks they encountered. Uh, in thinking about scoping, uh, we've spent more, more time digging into the data, uh, looking at market cap, uh, audited by various firms, uh, considering filer status, for example, uh, large accelerated filers, and also uh, what firms have a lot of audits of, of EGCs. And uh, we'll be working with the board in upcoming months, and as Chair Williams noted at the last meeting, uh, we don't intend to let this be a perpetual research project. Uh, that concludes my prepared remarks. Uh, with that, I'll pause to see if there are any questions. Thank you, Barb. So if members have questions, this is your opportunity. Barb is open for questions. I don't Does anyone have questions for Barb? I don't see any hands up, Saba. Yeah, so I think we'll just move to our next presentation. It seems like we're ahead Thank of Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Barb.
So next on the agenda, our panelists are are they are they here for the fourth panel? Because I'm not sure this is we're running ahead of time, and it seems like no one has questions for the for the for Barb. Taba, I don't see them listed as participants as panelists, but maybe they haven't been let in the. the the room yet? I'm not sure. This is yeah, Charlie Neymar. Oh, Charlie's on. Yeah. Yeah, Charlie. Well, we need we need to wait for the other members too, because since and I mean that presentation does not start until one one fifteen. Yep. So, oh, David has a question for for Bob. Uh, yeah. Well, if we've got spare time, Saba, and we've got Barb here, I I I, I would have a question for you. Barbara, it's a, it's quite a general one, but just a, a sense of your thinking about this. That, I mean, the audit is there. I completely agree to to protect, you know, the the average saver in the street. And Erica, I think, has made some great speeches about this. You said it as well, Saba. And the auditor has to be on the side of the investor. That that was the whole notion of the auditor it goes into the entity that is issuing its securities, but they're on the side of the investor, making sure that the investor is protected. At the same time, you need some rules by which the audit's done. But if you overdo the rules and all that the auditor feels that they need to do is to tick box their way through the rules, they end up um, with sort of less of a sense of the professional judgment through the through the mind of the investor, the average person in the street. I mean, when one's thinking about new audit standards, how do you think about that balance? Um, I mean, clearly you need the new audit standards. There's no question about that. But how do you make sure that the 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 the, the, the issuance of rules doesn't be isn't interpreted by the auditing firms as something that actually limits what they need to do to the rules? So that's a great question, David, and, and thank you so much. A, a bit of a tough one. Uh, I, I would say not, not only for us, but I think for any standard setters, uh, you're really looking to strike a balance between having enough requirements so that everyone applies things um, consistently as appropriate and has a bit of a floor for performance, but you also want to have enough principles such that people can apply a standard to every audit, right? Because we're writing requirements for audits of large, the largest companies in the world uh, to some very small broker dealer audits. Um, and so I think it's really a balance. And I think we also think about that um, our, our OERA colleagues who, who work on the economic analysis and focus on the actual impact the standard will have, um, I think that's all part of how we get there. And, and we always have wonderful views from, from board members, too, who have that in mind as they review, they review our project. Yeah, I think it's just, it's such a tricky balance. And, and I suppose my observation would be, that in financial markets, we've had a tendency to write more and more rules when we see things going wrong. And that is absolutely understandable. But but we also need a process that is a making sure that those who are implementing um, financial analysis or an audit or something like that are at all times using their professionalism to serve the people that they're there to serve, not to um, serve themselves or whatever is the particular financial interest uh, subject to the rules. And, and I just think that is just such a difficult, such a difficult balance for an organization like the PCOB to get right. Yeah, thank you. So I see two hands up now, uh, Parveen and Len. So Parveen. Uh, so it's it's interesting, David, that you asked that question. You kind of opened up the Pandora's box. And uh, Sama, you may remember in our last uh, subcommittee meeting on the transparency and inspections, Lynn and I engaged in that debate. Perhaps that's why Lynn has raised his hand too. Uh, 
I guess the spirit of the David's question, and I like that, is how a regulator would balance the uh, intent behind the standards as opposed to checking off the checklists which standards end up providing. And which is the same question that comes again and again, even when Congress passes the laws because they leave the details for someone else to figure it out. So it's a question of the, the intent underlying the so-called law as opposed to, okay, I got these five items which were mentioned, therefore my audit complies with the rules and regulations. I don't care what the result is, whether the investors are protected or not, whether the informed decisions are made or not, but I have done my job. So I think uh, that's that's where the entire debate is. That's very helpful, uh, Praveen. And I also see Lynn's hand up. I would say that it's important to keep in mind about half the standards that are still existing as interim PCLB standards were written by the profession itself uh, and the AICPA Auditing Standards Board. And I think it's safe to say the ASB did not write prescriptive type uh, standards uh, at all having overseen that process, in fact. So for that half, it's a non-concern. On the other half, where the PCLB has gone in and rewritten rules, if you would take the time to read the risk assessment uh, rule and read the uh, auditor judgment rule, both of which the PCLB has rewritten, there really is no prescription per se type in there. Those are both uh, extremely principled type approaches. If anything, I would say they went too far that way because once you get to a pure principle based type rule, especially if at the very beginning of the rule, you don't say what the objective of that rule is, then you lose the principle. And the PCAOB hasn't always at the beginning of its rules or standards is a better way to put it, hasn't always defined the objective such that when the PCOB comes to enforce it, they can ultimately go to the objective and say, did the auditor, when using their judgment, uh, uh, achieve the objective? And that's why that objective is extremely important to put, put in there. And when you look at the judgment type or the judgment standard, I think it gives the auditor all of the latitude they need uh, to do whatever procedures. There's nothing in those standards that turn around and say, uh, if you just check these boxes, you're done. And in fact, they require the auditor to use the professional judgment. And keep in mind, we have two types of professional judgment. One where it's well-reasoned, well-documented and supported by persuasive evidence, which the standards require, or two, bad, judgments where it doesn't meet uh, the requirements of the standards that the PCLB has uh, laid out. And therein is where the biggest problem pops up in the audits. People haven't gone in and got a clear cut understanding of the business on which to make a founded and supportable assessment of risk. And in turn, then make judgments as to exactly what an auditor needs to do or not do, or in how they evaluate the results of the audit procedures that they do have done. So, so far to date, I would say the PCLB has provided plenty of latitude, if anything, gone too far without 
laying out the objectives. And if you look at the QC proposal, there have been a number of comments from investors on that that have commented, and I think rightfully so, that the board has essentially left it up to the firms to decide what quality control procedures they would and processes they would put in place. And so in essence, they'll be setting their own standard. And that's a common common theme in the comment letters that have come in. I think it's a, it's a valid point. So if anything, maybe it's gone too far. Thank you, Lynn. So as, as Barb uh, earlier mentioned in, in her opening remarks, we're still, the staff is, is reviewing comments and they'll be taken into consideration. And we also have, have reached out, as you know, to mem some members of the IAG as well as other investors to schedule follow-up calls. So more on that later. I see uh, two hands up, Amy, and then Hal is next. Amy. Thanks, Saba. Barb, thanks for the presentation or the discussion. Um, you know, we really appreciate it. Uh, I'm just curious. I know the PCOB had published some updated information on CAMS and investors' reaction to CAMS, auditors' reactions to CAMS. Can you update us on where things are as it relates to CAMS, if there's anything on the horizon? Um, I think that the IAG will look to host uh, a CAMS roundtable um, at our next meeting in June, uh, but we would be interested if there's any movement on that at all uh, since we last spoke. Uh, sure, um, I'll, I'll do my best because that work is is handled by our Office of, of Economic and Risk Analysis. Uh, what you would have seen recently uh, relates to their post implementation review. Uh, and I think it would be very interesting and, and timely to to think about a CAMS roundtable. So I'll, I'll look forward to that. Thanks, Barb. Thank you, Amy, for your question, and thank you, Barb. Hell, you're next. Hell, it looks like you're on mute. Uh, Have your, your, here. The, yeah, the we, button finally worked. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I want to go back to David's uh, original comments. And David, I, I'm trying to make sure I understand what you were saying that the auditor should be putting the ultimate consumer of the information uh, at first in line in terms of their considerations. Is, is that? Yeah, no, no, I, I, I think that I think that's right, Hal. The the purpose of the audit is the protection of the ultimate investor, and therefore that has to be sort of first in your mind. And and of course there are all sorts of pressures and incentives not to do that. So that might be something that you're wanting to bolster in in the auditor's mind. And that there's a can be a tension between that and the writing of rules. Yeah. And people then say, if I meet the rules, I've done my job and I can do anything else I want. I, I like the concept. What I'm trying to understand and appreciate is how, what requirement is there for the auditor to actually understand what investors do? And I, and I'm, and I would put that in reverse as well. I think there's an obligation for investors to understand what auditors do. And my experience over the last few decades suggest that auditors have very little knowledge of what investors actually do, how they consume the information. And I can assure you that investors have very little knowledge about how the information that they're consuming is being produced. Those and are, I, I think those are brilliant questions, Hal. Absolutely brilliant questions. Because if you're right that this is for the investor and it's the ultimate investor that 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 like uh, Saba was talking about and Erica has in her speeches, how much is that topmost in the auditor's mind? How much are the auditors investigating what it is that people are going to do with this information, thinking about how that? And I just, I just wonder whether there are opportunities to encourage more of that sort of stuff. And, and, and I, investors as well. I mean, investors are not great at this. I, I know I've been brought in on a few situations where 
I've been asked to explain what investors actually do for a living. And I've been somewhat amused <laughs> at the questions and the lack of, of understanding. And, and I appreciate why, you know, you, if you grow up in the audit world, you don't spend a lot of time actually meeting real investors and talking to them and understanding what they do, how they do it. And, you know, they don't understand the wide range of the different types of investors and strategies. Uh, and on the flip side, my, my favorite comment has always been the investor who came into my office and said, oh, well, these numbers are accurate. The auditors signed off on them. And talking about judgments and estimates and things that go into developing financial statements. So there's just lack of knowledge on both sides. And I'm wondering what role PCAOB uh, could play in helping educate, frankly, both sides of that equation. Because I think, you know, while I listen to Len's comments about principles and objectives, until both sides understand the other, that communication is not going to be open. And I think we're, we're missing some really big low hanging fruit on that issue. But I, I lay that out as a, a topic for maybe the IAG to talk about in the future, but I just see a real opportunity there to maybe improve the, the knowledge on both sides of the equation. That's that's actually a wonderful idea. I mean, I, and I think just to turn the table to you guys, it would be great if the IAG could come up with some suggestions and recommendations on how we could further enhance our outreach to investors. This is sh shameless self promotion, but you saw we uh, the IAG, the PCOB Office of Investor Advocate issued. Uh, an inv investor advisory yesterday on proof of reserve. So that is one piece of such uh, investor education tool that we're planning to use, but it would be wonderful to get input from members of the IEG on how we can enhance it. So with that, I'll move. I see two hands up. So uh, San Sandy Peters, you're next. Thanks. Um I think that uh, <clears throat> Hal's point is a good one. I agree and disagree with it at the same time. I think that it's true. Um, and, uh, but I'm, I have to say that I remember doing a survey on all of the transparency objectives related to audit back right after the financial crisis. And I thought we were gonna do a survey and that we weren't gonna get any good um, feedback because it's hard to get feedback on the financial reporting, not a, but the audit is sort of like, you know, a second derivative of that. So it's even more challenging. But I was really surprised at the, the high quality of the comments. It may not be communicated in the parlance that auditors um, can under, or the, the way the auditors speak, but certainly they have a view about what they want. Maybe not exactly what everything is. So that's where I agree with the comment that communication on both sides, and I think it gets to the point that we made in a in our recent comment letter about talking to them in a way, both of them, in a way in which they can understand um, e each other. I think that's particularly important. On David's point, you know, I think it's a really good one, and I um, back when CAMs were first published. I highlighted that, and, and I remember having a debate with somebody at the PCAOB, and I said, hey, you know, segments are one of the top 10 questions of the SEC in their comment letters, and it's the only item of those top 10 that doesn't appear as a CAM. And they're like, well, but that's not, it's not investors' perspective that matters in determining that something is a CAM. And while I get that, um, because it's, the difficulty of the audit process, inherently investors care about it because they're making investment decisions on it and there are inherently massive judgments and estimates involved in it. And I'm not sure auditors understand that, right? So I, I actually think when I think about auditing standards, some of the things that um, there need to be in some instances requirements that auditors contextualize and inform themselves with respect to what the market is going on in the market related to their particular client, which I don't always feel like happens, right? Because I think it relates to the con the conversation we're gonna have about fraud. The market seems to identify it before the auditors because they're not reading. And this came up in the, in the conversation about CAMs when they were first published is that you're gonna put this CAM out there amidst 
um, investors who have a view on what might be more important to them and more risky to them. And it should be as an auditor more risky to you. So I think that David's point is a good one. I agree with, um, I'm always surprised at how much investors do know, but I always think, as to Hal's point, there's better information and understanding that can happen on both sides. So I just wanted to add that because I think it's about context and mindset. This is, uh, thank you, Sandy. That's actually really, really helpful uh, information. So thank you. Uh, I see, I saw Mary's hand and also Lynn's. So Mary, would you still like to ask your question? Um, yes, this is really a very interesting discussion because I'm looking at things strictly from the investor point of view. I mean, I've had very little experience with the audit myself. Um, and I'm finding more and more that investors are moving away from fundamental research. And there's a lot of the younger generation that are very, very bright, but I don't see that critical sort of thinking around a lot of the financials corporate financials. And I also don't think that a lot of investors, and I know Sandy, you're probably in a better position than I am to speak to this, but I'm wondering how much people really understand what the audit does and how it functions for investors. And I've learned a lot by being on the IEG. Um, I've learned a lot about the audit that I didn't know. And I really liked your piece yesterday, Saba, because I think the more that we put things out there, like watch out for this, or this is important, um, we're educating investors. And I think it's a two-way street. I don't think the auditors look at risk the same way investors do. I think we come at it from a different perspective, but we're often looking at the same thing. So I think it's good to have this dialogue around, you know, the investor perspective. Um, and I'm delighted to see this discussion because I think not only will we learn a lot about what the audit should and shouldn't accomplish, but I think investors will grow to understand more. So thank you. No, thank you. This is actually really helpful and is giving us ideas and, you know, things to think about and different approaches. So Len, you're next and then Sandy. Len, you're on mute. Sorry. I auditors in every audit have to make a determination of what how an investor were, would view things, especially on the issue of materiality. So if an auditor hasn't thought about how a reasonable informed person uh, would view that item, then that would be of uh, grave con concern. And it's interesting if you look at the lead in language to SOX, it talks about the obligation of the PCOB is to uh, investor protection. And it actually uses the word accurate financial information uh, as well and, and, and uses that, that term, which I think sometimes, maybe all too often, auditors try to walk away from that um, and try to say, well, the, na the numbers are within these large range, but given the evidence and support that's available to the management team, it still comes down to within that context, are they accurate? And that's why SOX uses that language. When I was one of the founders in running Glass Lewis and we were doing financial research, what I found was the auditors uh, really don't understand at times the information that's available, including to analysts that would be members of Sandy's organization and, and really don't mind that information as they could. And, and at times, uh, and we met with all the large firms uh, during that time period, and they just, quite frankly, 
we're not even aware of the information that Wall Street used in mind to analyze companies, which I found to be astounding. And, and to, to a large degree, that still exists today. The firms talk about all the data mining they're doing, but it's data mining of the company's databases, not of information like Wall Street would often use to do that analysis. And as a result, they're just missing a great opportunity to, I think, uh, learn some invaluable information during the course of the audit. And I would tell you, when I was an audit partner and an auditor signing reports, I think I was in the same boat as uh, many of the audit partners today. You just get no education on that in universities. Universities actually teach their finance uh, students in this respect much better than they do the auditing students. They teach them how to do that financial analyst analysis, how to use the Bloomberg terminals. And that just doesn't happen within the uh, accounting and auditing curriculum today. So there's the first shortfall and it's a serious shortfall. And, and then as they get into the firms, again, they just don't uh, get that education because they don't use those tools and uh, they're still relying on the database for management. Well, that database is put together and, and controlled by management and people think that those people are going to turn over a database that has information in it that would highlight that the financials are wrong and maybe uh, fraudulently wrong. That ain't going to happen. That's very, very helpful, Lynn. I also see a few hands. So, Andy, you're next. And after Andy, it's Hal and Gary. Okay, so, Andy, you're you. next. Thank you very much. I, I would just like to echo um, a word that Mr. Turner used, accurate. Um, I think it's very important for the PCOB to consider the distinction between accurate reality and accurate according to the rules. Companies are very adept, and I am one of the poster boys for this, unfortunately, uh, at exploiting the rules to make the numbers intentionally inaccurate in a reality sense. And this is a, an entire type of fraud that I don't think is focused on. We're very focused on finding the intentional um, fraudulent entry as opposed to the fraud that occurs by exploiting loopholes or the ambiguity and complexity in the rules, which um, is more the Enron story than, uh, than the, the former. Um, so uh, I encourage you, uh, when you use words like fair, words like accurate, uh, with relate, related to the financial statements that you create a distinction between reality and according to the rules. Thank you, Andy. I, that's, that's actually helpful. Hal, I see your hand is next and then Gary. Um, I'm, going to, I'm reacting back to um, Lynn's comments about uh, materiality. I absolutely agree that it's very difficult to actually apply materiality standards without understanding how investors think. So I've been quite surprised in the last 15 years or so when I've had some incredibly smart auditors that I've talked to after I've given a speech or had some conversation, and I will have mentioned the sell side versus the buy side. And I'll get this quite often. I've lost track of how many times the very sheepish question at the end in private. Could you please explain the difference between the sell side and the buy side? And if you, if you lack that basic knowledge of what the roles of the sell side and buy side are and the different roles within the sell side and buy side, it's really, from my perspective, hard to make a good assessment of materiality. The other observation I would make is, that there's a real lack of understanding of the timing and flow of information. 
Uh, many auditors think that the 10 Qs and 10 Ks for the biggest companies are the primary source of information. When in fact, at least my experiences, it's been the earnings releases, the supplemental packages, information that comes out around the conference calls, more so than the Qs and Ks. So, you know, to me, there's just a real lack of understanding. And, um, and I agree with, with uh, Len's comments, how do you apply the materiality standard if you don't have that understanding? So I just throw that out based on, you know, my experiences the last, you know, 15 years or so. Thank you, Hal. Thank you for sharing that perspective. It's really, really helpful. And this is this is a great discussion. Actually, we're getting so many wonderful ideas. Uh, next is is Gary, Gary Walsh. Gary, I think you're on mute. Gary, you're still no. on mute. He's not on mute. Uh, we just can't hear him. Gary, if you want to type maybe your question in, we can read it aloud. Um, I don't know if maybe Brian, you have any suggestions for hearing Gary, but it says he's not muted. I'll, I'll go ahead and work with him. Uh, see if we can get that straightened out. But yeah, I, for right now, uh, typing it into the chat for us would be the quickest solution. Great. Thanks, Brian. Saba, should we pivot to the next panel? Oh, wait, David's hand is up. Sorry. I, it, it was it was just a thought, Amy. I mean, I've I've enjoyed the 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 last discussion. I, I think it is it's quite an important one. There may be some things that we've experimented with in the UK that are kind of interesting in 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 in, in this area. I mean pretty formally now there would be meetings between the big audit firms and groups of investors about what it was that was being looked for for the audit where it was that things had seen seemed that were lacking and that wasn't happening um a, a six or seven years ago and these are ones that are very strongly encouraged by the frc so when i was the independent at kpmg um, we would have the first half of the meeting that was with the head of audit and the investors. And then the executives from KPMG would leave and the independent executive would be there with the investors. I mean, I'm not sure that it solved all the problems of the world, but I, it may have shuffled, moved things forward just a little bit. And I'm not quite sure what the situation is in the United States, but there may be other things that are happening in other places that might be helpful for the PCOB in terms of trying to um, sort of strengthen that sense of the audit is for somebody else out there. And I would define that the way Saba does in terms of the person on the street who depends on it for the security of their pension and their saving and all the rest of it. Thank you. So I see Chair Williams's hand. Thanks, Saba. Um, I know that we're going to be segueing into the next panel. I wanted to just say that I found this um, impromptu discussion to be extremely useful uh, for a number of reasons. First, as you all know, we are always trying to make sure that we're thinking of new ways to address and reach investors. And our investor advisory um, from yesterday is just one example. And so the feedback that we um, have been getting during this meeting about how we might continue to do that is really useful. And I also think that a number of the comments can be very informative as we think about some of our future standard setting projects, for example, um, NOQAR. Um, and I know we're about to hear from the fraud panel on the NOQAR project and the fraud project really do fit hand in hand. And during the fraud panel, I'm really interested in hearing on approaches or methods that other professions, maybe forensic accountants and others may be using to detect fraud and how those approaches might be um, applied in the financial statement audit. So I look forward to this next panel, but I just wanted to say thank you for this impromptu discussion. Thank you, Chair Williams. So I think it, it's where the time is perfect for our next uh, panel. Brian, could you please put it up? So next on the agenda is the IAG's subcommittee on standards presentation to the PCOB. The title of this discussion is fraud, 
It is simply put, but this topic is neither easy nor simple. In October of last year, the SEC Chief Accountant, Paul Munter, reminded auditors of their long-standing responsibilities to detect fraud. In the U.S., the auditing profession was born out of the need for fraud detection. The Association of Certified Fraud Examiners reported that the average fraud goes undetected for approximately one year. Investors bear the fraud losses, but there are many others left in the wake. Moreover, this topic is very timely for two reasons. The auditor's responsibility to detect fraud is on the PCAOB standard setting agenda. Academic and academic research has shown that there is a correlation between fraud and recession. The probability that fraud increases when there is a downturn in the macroeconomic condition. As the PCOB looks at updating its standard on fraud, hopefully this discussion will provide the board with information and perspective about approaches and methods other profession, as Chair Williams mentioned, such as consultant, friend, uh, academics, short sellers, and security analysts have used to detect fraud, and how such approaches or methods to detect fraud might be applied in the audited financial statements. Today's discussion on fraud will be moderated by Professor Jennifer Jo. The panelists are Andy Festow, Professor Shiva Raj Gopal, former board member Charlie Niemeyer, and Stephen Thomas. Bios of the participants were included in the agenda that was circulated earlier. As a reminder, the views presented during this session are those of the panelists, and they do not represent the views of the PCAB board or any individual board member or the staff. So with that, I'll hand the floor over to Professor Jennifer Jo. Thank you very much, Saba. Um, and uh, I am speaking on behalf, well, probably do not, the, pan, um, the members of the subcommittee wouldn't probably like to, me to say that I'm speaking on their behalf, but I thank uh, the, the chair of the subcommittee, James Andrus, who has asked me to moderate the panel on behalf of the subcommittee. Um, the panelists we chose for you today bring a variety of uh, perspectives and, and they vary in their audit expertise, but they were selected to bring these various perspectives. Andy Fastow was an active participant in the type of fraud we would like to see auditors detected, um, detect on audits. Um, he was the CFO of Enron at the time of, the, of its demise. Um, Charlie Nehemiah brings to our panel expertise as a standard setter and fraud in investigator. He previously served as a founding board member of the PCOB, co-head of the SEC's Fraud Task Force, and chief accountant of the SEC uh, Division of Enforcement. Siva Rajkabal is a well-published researcher and vocal critic of uh, the auditing and accounting profession. He is the Keister and Barnes Professor of Accounting at Columbia Business School. And finally, uh, but definitely not last, is uh, Stephen Thomas, who has successfully brought actions against auditors for negligence in failing to detect fraud. He's a lawyer and a former partner at Sullivan and, and Cromwell. So, you know, one of the key questions you might ask is, why are we bringing this panel on fraud? Um, because, simply put, fraud continues to be a major source of wealth loss for investors, as well as the PCOB's inspections have identified recurring deficiencies in auditors' application of due care and professional skepticism when addressing frauds on audits. Um, oftentimes, the, the, regulated, uh, the inspectors have found that auditors' response to frauds were inefficient and insufficient. Um, as Saba mentioned also, uh, SEC Chief Accountant Paul Mother observed that as primary gatekeepers, their enforcement actions highlight that firm personnel were engaged in improper conduct um, regarding risk assessment um, due to misstatements of fraud. So one of our members of the subcommittee suggested that I remind us where the the you know, the foundations for auditor responsibility for fraud um, lies within the standard. And if we go very back to PS um, audit standards 001, it says that the auditor has the responsibility to plan and perform the audit 
to obtain reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free of material misstatement, whether caused by fraud or error. And then AS2401 establishes more detailed requirements and provides directions to auditors on fulfilling that responsibility. Um, what I'd like you know, the audience today to note is that the standard set an equivalent responsibility for misstatement due to fraud um, and misstatement due to error. So it doesn't make fraud lower than misstatements due to error. And also the standard um, has the absolute, uh, the reasonable assurance uh, threshold, but elsewhere, the PCOB's conceptual framework has brought out that that reasonable assurance threshold, even though it's not absolute assurance, is nevertheless a high level of assurance. So with those um, you know, thoughts and background, I'd like to um, turn to our panelists. And to start our conversation, I've asked each panelist to share their perspective um, just briefly for a minute or two on the fundamental issue that we face in detecting and preventing fraud in financial statement audits. And so I'll go over, uh, I'll, I'll have a start in alphabetical order. And so Andy, could you share with us your thoughts? Yes, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'd like to echo my comment from earlier. What I'd like to talk about is a distinct type of fraud, the type of fraud that occurs when companies aren't simply putting in the wrong numbers intentionally, but when companies are exploiting the rules to make their financial statements look different than reality. Um, when this occurs, very often the government enforcement agencies will make the case look as if the company has simply been committing black or white fraud putting in the wrong numbers. Um, but in reality, many of these cases where you have fraud, especially in large companies occur because these companies are um, uh, exploiting the accounting rules, um, uh, accounting assumptions, and they're using structured finance in order to make their financial statements look healthier than they really are. Um, I would emphasize again the importance of creating a distinction in the minds of auditors between what is accurate according to the rules and what is accurate in reality. My experience is somewhat limited, but my experience in talking to a variety of auditors is that their standard is that the company is following the rules. There's an entire industry of bankers and accountants and attorneys who do nothing except help these large companies exploit the rules. Um, let me use a simple example of uh, how financial statements could be following a rule, but completely divorced from reality. In 2014, the average price of oil was $95 per barrel. Um, what occurred in 2014 is their price was around $110 per barrel most of the year, and then it dropped down to 50 at year end. The average was 95. At the time, there was an accounting rule, uh, an SEC rule, which was codified in GAAP, that told companies exactly what number to use when they calculated their economically recoverable reserves. You take the price of oil on the first day of each of the 12 preceding months and you average it, 95. But the price was 50 at year end. And the price was 50 when every oil and gas company released their financial statements. And I could say with a high degree of certainty that at that point in time, none of those oil and gas companies had 95 on their 10 year forward price curve any longer. All of them followed the rule. They used 95. All of them massively overstated their economically recoverable reserves, which is perhaps the most important metric that Wall Street looks at when they evaluate independent oil and gas companies. I often give talks to groups of business people, 
and I give him a case study on this situation. And first, I don't tell him what the rule is. And I show him what the companies have done or what a company has done using 95 to value their reserves. Everyone unanimously always says it is unethical. It is materially misleading and they would not do it. Then I show them the rule. And almost everyone says it's okay that the company did it. The mindset among people is so long as you're following the rules, it doesn't matter if the financial statements are misleading. It doesn't matter if they're divorced from reality. I encourage the PCAOB to consider this issue and, uh, as their rulemaking um, because there are people like me, unfortunately, um, who are going to exploit every one of these situations to make their financial statements look healthier than they really are. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll turn to you, Char Charlie. Um, Andy has given us an example of a gray area matter, but you focus directly on explicit fraud um, on the financial statements. Uh, so could you give us a pers your perspective on why do you think we have this problem where auditors are often the last to detect major financial fraud? Sure. Thank you, Jennifer, and and thank you for the group here for the opportunity to engage in this discussion. I think this is very healthy. Um, and, and Andy, thank you for your perspective as well. It's very important that you're willing to, to share your views and contribute to this. Um, I, I think this is very important, obviously, that we're focusing on fraud. This is the reason why the PCOB was created. Um, and, and, you know, it, it certainly, uh, Enron was a very important part of, of, of creating the environment in which the PCOB was was created. Um, when you look at uh, the reasons why fraud continues to be a problem, it it shouldn't be a big uh, surprise because fraud, by its nature, will always be out there to the extent there's somebody who's looking for a way to better the presentation, and there is a lot of complexity. Uh, with the financial presentations, there's a lot of complexity with the markets. There's always dynamics that are changing that makes this very difficult. It's very important to keep a high standard for auditors when, in detecting fraud. Um, that said, when you look at the reasons why auditors didn't find fraud, it was often not because they failed to comply with the existing auditing standards. And many times, I would say most auditors would, if they found a fraud, they would, if they saw it as fraud, they would, they would declare it as such. However, um, this goes to what Andy was talking about to a certain extent. This is not so easy. It's not black and white. After the fact, the regulator can point to it and say, yes, this was clearly fraud. It is not so clear in the real world. And most auditors, when you do the autopsies of these cases, many times the auditors identified the area in which turned out to be fraud as a high risk area. So why was it so difficult? What was the challenge to them to actually take it to the next level and say, this is identify it as, as a fraud. And I would say that we can look at the standards. We can try to, you know, do whatever we can to improve it. But this is a bigger issue than just the PCLB. Maybe ironically, but when the PCOB was created, Sarbanes-Oxley was designed to address fraud in the system, but most of Sarbanes-Oxley focused on the audit profession itself. This is a this is much broader, and there's a lot more to actually to deal with. So let's look at the challenges that auditors face. First off, we all know this, but it's the real world for auditors. They are they are required to be independent from the companies they audit. But who pays them? Sarbanes Oxley tried to deal with that by saying, well, a strong audit committee is the way you'll deal with that. That's great in theory. And if you have a great audit committee, and there are a lot of great audit committees, but there are audit committees that aren't so great either. And without there, there's no real buffer between the company and the auditor. So the business context in which audits perform is a challenge. Now, that challenge becomes greater when you're dealing with areas 
and the accounting standards where company has discretion. You know, and Andy has identified a, a great area there, one that he knows well, uh, the use of fair value. Fair value is, we all like the idea of having a presentation of what the, what the values are. But fair value, especially level three, becomes very difficult for an auditor to address. It becomes often what management wants it to be. And it's one of the reasons why in good times, everything looks good and in recessions, things look bad because just like a light switch, that value disappears. But how does the auditor address that when the standards, allow, the accounting standards actually allow the flexibility? That's true for impairments, the way impairments work. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of areas uh, where uh, this level of discretion makes it very difficult for auditors to do their job. Again, I'm not saying auditors shouldn't be held to a high standard. They should be. But in the real world, this is a very difficult job when it comes to having discussions with a company that is basically your boss. Maybe they shouldn't be, but that's the reality of what auditors are, are dealing with. Sometimes it's the culture. And you know, maybe in the United States, we have less of a concern with this, but there are areas in which the culture is not great. Maybe it's a a type of industry in which the culture is, is, is not necessarily good, but often you're dealing with uh, markets outside the United States where this is, this is true. In some environments, the most simple uh, auditing standards requirements, such as confirmations, really don't work because confirmations aren't readily re returned. Or where the level of corruption is, quite frankly, beyond what we can even comprehend. Um, and yet auditors are operating in those environments affecting uh, the, the U.S. markets. And then I would say there's the incentive system. Uh, if a whistleblower comes forward identifying a fraud, um, they're held by the regulatory community and investor community as being heroes. For auditors, identifying a fraud is typically a really uh, bad day for them. Uh, not only is it going to be a difficult in, in dealing with client relations, that becomes the minor part of it. The more difficult part becomes now they bought themselves possibly years of uh, legal investigations, uh, depositions, and second guessing why they didn't find it earlier. Uh, I think a very important part of this discussion that you've already focused on uh, is having a connection between the investor community and the, and the auditors. Auditors are not the enemy. Auditors don't commit fraud. They may have difficulties in detecting fraud, and there may be ways they can help to do that, but management commits fraud. The auditors is, should be aligned with management, but unfortunately, the behavioral science aspects of this uh, drive auditors to be more aligned unfortunately, with management instead of the investor community. And I think anything that can be done that can bolster that relationship between the investor community and auditors and communication lines to, to be, you know, whether that's uh, ready discussions, what David was talking about that may happen in the UK, uh, but whatever can be done to, to improve the relationship between auditors and investors I think will go a long way uh, to be helpful to address fraud. So to get to the, the sort of the nub of it, as far as what we're focusing on here, I think there's a certain things that can be done with the standards at the PCOB level, but to really, to address this issue of detecting and preventing fraud, it's broader than the PCOB. And I, okay. I do think you need position to be able to to help that dialogue and to bring all the constituents together to address it, which would include FASB, it would include the SEC, it would include communications between the audit profession and the investor community. Anyway, thank you. Okay, thank you, Charlie. I, I would like to jump ahead to Stephen Thomas because one of the things I, um, I would like Stephen to respond to is that you said, you know, it's really difficult for auditors to detect fraud. And I know that Stephen in his successful prosecutions have found um, instances where the auditors have definitely identified. And Stephen, 
I, I not to put words in your mouth, but I think you would say it's not that difficult. So we'd like to hear your thoughts on the fundamental problem. Sure, thank you. Uh, I mean, we've been involved in every major fraud since about 2005 in the United States, and most of them we've taken to trial. Uh, we haven't had a single time where it was difficult to find the fraud. Um, we also haven't had a single time where the auditors were not identified by the jury or the judge as grossly negligent. So I just don't think the reality of at least in the big frauds are exactly what we're hearing. Um, it's And when we first started this, I thought we were going to make a real difference because we were going to cause auditors to have to be held accountable for their audits. Uh, I've long ago given up that hope. Um, and I can tell you from our experience, it's pretty straightforward. It's not that complex. Auditors don't find fraud because they don't have any incentive to do so. In fact, their incentive is just the opposite because certainly in the large frauds, these clients, the part, the audit partner, whether it's a big four or a mid-tier firm, their incentive is to keep that client because the amount of money they make is tied to that client because they're being paid by that client who they're supposed to detect fraud from. So the individual partner's incentive is to keep that client happy. And then when you get to bigger clients, you find out that even though the big four are making billions of dollars, their incentive is to keep that client happy. So as recently as, I think I was in trial and. 2017 and the audit partner revealed on the stand that when he raised an issue that actually was the issue that how the fraud was being conducted, he got a call from the head of the big four accounting firm, the chairman of the entire firm called him up to ask why he was causing so much trouble. And of course he stopped causing trouble, kept that client and it turned out to be one of the largest frauds in us history. So, the idea that you know they're just not doing a good job but just can't quite find it that's just not the reality i mean the reality is they don't have an incentive to find it so they act appropriately they act consistent with their financial incentive and for that individual partner that is to keep that client because they've found out that most of the time there isn't a fraud so if they don't do a very good job no one knows and no one finds out and if there is a big fraud, most of the cases, you know, it's just the plaintiffs, maybe class action lawyers who, you know, will do a cheap settlement. The fine they're going to face from the PCOB is a pittance. The SEC is not going to do anything to them. So their whole incentive is to do the, the, do the audits as cheaply as possible to make as much money as possible. And that's what would they do. So it, it may surprise you because we say here, oh, of course it's their job to detect fraud, but that's not what they tell people and that's not what they think. I mean, as recently as 2021, a mid-tier accounting firm was telling a judge that it was not their job to find fraud, that audits weren't supposed to be designed to find fraud. As recently as 2017, 18, a big four accounting firm was telling a judge that even though their former chairperson had told the Wall Street Journal it was their job to find fraud, he was mistaken. He didn't understand the rules. The, I took the deposition of an a intern at the SEC from one of the big accounting firms in 2018 who said audits aren't designed to, to find fraud while he was interning at the SEC, that that wasn't the auditor's job. And then six months later, he left the SEC, went back to the big four accounting firm and became a partner. So he had testified under oath and this time came out fairly publicly that it wasn't their job to detect fraud. That's not what audits were designed to do. And what was his reward? He made partner six months later. So that's the reality. So until that changes, I mean, I don't mean to be a big pessimist, but I mean, I just, I don't think it's going to change because their financial incentive is just the opposite. Okay, thank you so much, Stephen. And um, I would just like to remind people in with respect to Andy's comment about the gray area matter and the accounting regulations. 
I would like to encourage people to look at AS2401, which specifically tells the auditor to look at the business purpose for the transactions. That when there are transactions where management is just engaging in those transactions for financial statement um, purpose, rather than the actual, you know, when I say financial statement purpose, I'm referring to window dressing for financial statement purpose rather than the actual business purpose of the transaction, that auditors should view that as a risk indicator of fraud and, to, and they should be following up on, on those matters. So AS2401 actually provides a lot of guidance to auditors, I think. Um, and Stephen, you were successful in pointing out with like the Colonial Bank case where they weren't doing those things that the standard told them to do. Um, yeah, that, that's correct. I mean, the stuff is usually pretty simple. A colonial bank is a good example. Colonial bank was a fraud where the fraudsters said, again, under on the stand, look, one of the things we're pretending is there was all these mortgages that didn't exist. And you're supposed to have physical mortgages. But we didn't, the fraudsters couldn't create all the physical mortgages because they were a small group. So what they counted on was the auditor who came each year to audit, not just pushing B on the elevator and going down to the basement and looking in the vault where there was supposed to be all these stacks of mortgages and there weren't any. But every day the auditors came in and they went up to the fourth floor and they waited for stuff to be brought to them and they went out to lunch and they came back and they went away and they never bothered to look at the primary asset of the whole thing, which if they had just gone down to the basement, they would have seen. I mean, there are a bunch of other stuff in that case too, but I mean, that was one of the most vivid examples, which they were told where the mortgages were kept and they just never bothered to go look. Right. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like to draw Shiva Rajkapal into the conversation. Um, you mentioned incentives and I know that Siva thinks that there are gross problems with the incentive model for audits. So Shiva, if you could give us your, co your foundational comments, we'd appreciate it at this time. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, James, and thanks to the committee. Um, so, 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 Jennifer, the way you framed it, you asked, why are the auditors the last people in the value chain to discover fraud? And I want to broaden the question a little bit and ask, do statutory audits uh, help investors of publicly listed companies to even assess financial reporting risk anymore? And as you rightly point out, at, at least my central message is that both incentives and penalties to discover fraud are pretty limited. And this is based on four research papers that I'm happy to forward to whoever wants to look at the, the, the underlying evidence. Uh, so proposition number one, discovered fraud is barely half or a third of quote unquote actual fraud that happens. So fraud discovery is hard for whatever reason, points that others have made. Point number two, and this is a bit more disturbing, you know, why do short sellers like, say, Hindenburg with discoverable public information seem to find fraud faster than auditors with a lot of private information? You know, and uh, we have a paper where we show that even after these so-called activist shots come out and say things that are pretty damaging, let's say reporting is a problem, disclosure is a problem, at least we are not able to find anything in terms of what auditors do in response. Uh, so, point number three, the penalties issue, right? So, in a classroom, in, invariably, when, when fraud happens, students ask, you know, where were the auditors? Who audits the auditors? And the usual answer we give them is, oh, it's litigation. But if you look at the data, the number of 10B5 lawsuits against auditors in the last few years has fallen into the single digits. So, it's pretty hard to sue uh, auditors as well. And the final point, we have another paper where we show that, you know, the SEC seems to go a bit easier on the auditors relative to, say, CEOs, CFOs, and managers who are accused of wrongdoing. So neither are the penalties strong, in my view, nor are the incentives strong. So what can you do, perhaps as the PCOB and probably us as a society? I'm just going to spend a few minutes discussing that. First, maybe we can get auditors to issue something like letter grades on clients, like what the credit rating agencies do, as opposed to a simple pass-fail grade, uh, 
And as you know, the pass grade is like 97% unqualified opinion or something along, along those directions. It's a boilerplate statement. I don't know what to do with it as an investor. Some kind of letter grade would help. Point number two, the PCOB conducts inspections, finds problems with the audits of client companies. You don't name the clients, you name the audit firms. So consider naming the clients, even maybe after a cooling off period, and that would help me understand where did you actually find problems? Point number three, you know, even under the Official Secrets Act, documents get disclosed with appropriate redactions. We rarely see work papers of audit firms. So consider maybe some way to kind of get the audit uh, working papers released, maybe after a five-year period, 10-year period, give them a litigation safe hub or something. Three more radical ideas, which may be beyond the PCOB's remit, but since this is a free-flowing, you know, interesting academic conversation, I want to throw it out. One, just inject more competition in the audit market, and who would be the most appropriate people to do this? Maybe the rating agencies. Open the rating agencies market to the auditors and open the, you know, audit market to the rating agencies. So instead of the big four, we'll now have three more players, and maybe in the rating agencies market, instead of the big three, we'll have four more players. Right. Second idea, this is going back to Stephen Thomas's point, who pays them, right? Consider inserting a third party insurer, like, like say the Lloyds of London. So how does this work? The company buys financial statement insurance, say from Lloyds. Lloyds appoints the auditor and the risk premium, which is hopefully on an arm's length basis, gets published. And as the, the premiums get published, you know, the public gets a sense for has the risk gone up or gone down, as opposed to all the other problems associated with cross-selling, you know, the audit fee is usually a constant number, usually a function of firm size and usually nothing else. And last but not least, this is probably even more radical than the other two. Consider making audits voluntary. I think making it mandatory is partly the problem. You know, the people then compete not on quality, but they compete on price and they try to make up for the cost in some other way. So anyway, these are some ideas. Happy to share uh, anything in terms of follow up or uh, feedback or papers. Thank you. Okay, so thanks everyone for their sort of foundational comments. I did notice that um, Charlie and, uh, and uh, Andy had their hands up. So I wanted to give you a chance to you know, make any responses that you did at this time, but I also wanted to make sure that each of the panelists had the opportunity to make their foundation statement. So, um, Andy first, and then Charlie, do you have any comments that you'd like to share now? Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Um, first, I'd like to address two things very quickly, uh, comments that were make or made earlier. So, uh, AS2401, uh, um, I think that's a good, um, that's good guidance. Um, there's no question about it, but, um, and I don't, I don't mean to be, uh, sound inappropriate when I say this in a way, though, it, it strikes me as similar to asking the question to someone, is this ethical? Um, I'm often invited to give, uh, lectures to companies for their ethics and compliance seminars. And I start out by asking them, what is ethics? And inevitably people say doing the right thing. And then I press them well, about what's doing the right thing. And what becomes very clear is on almost every issue, half the people say it's right and half the people say it's wrong. So where they always come back to is saying the right thing is following the rules, which is the same as compliance. Um, so I think it's important to some, I, and I don't know how to do this, is to, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the analogy is saying a transaction has to have a real business function. Um, that's debatable and companies can make it appear as if it's a valid business reason. So I don't think it goes far enough in capturing what you want to capture, if, if I could say it that way. Um, the other the other comment I wanted to make just gets back to uh, what what Charlie and Stephen were referring to earlier in the auditor's independence and ability to speak up just by sharing an anecdote. 
I was hired by one of the big four accounting firms to go to several cities, many cities, to give lectures about the risks associated with the gray area of accounting and finance to both their auditors and their clients. And um, after I did all this tour of uh, all these cities, I sat down with the chief risk officer of this big four accounting firm. And I asked the person, I said, you know, you could have hired anyone in the world to give these lectures. Why did you hire me? And the response was, because you say things to our clients that our auditors are afraid to say. So I echo both Stephen and Charlie's comments about we have to do something to um, make it so that the auditors are not, don't feel beholden or don't feel um, that somehow um, a force from above is going to come down and punish them for speaking up. Okay, thank you, Andy. Um, Charlie? Yes, thank, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I, I just want to make sure that um, my comments are not misunderstood. Anything I'm saying is not an excuse for, for auditors not doing their job. And I actually think that uh, Andy and, and even Stephen and I are, are actually more aligned in our concerns and what we're saying that may, may appear, Stephen and I at least maybe, uh, at first, I don't think this is an issue about, you know, the extreme. I, I, I get, it. I mean, I've seen plenty of auditors not do their job, uh, but I'm talking about the practical as issues of really addressing fraud from a holistic basis. We can do so much with the auditors, but we need to recognize that there's a bigger picture and environment that's out there that should be addressed. And the incentives are not aligned as well as they should be. And that is an issue that unless we actually discuss it and try to address it, I think will always be uh, a thorn in our side in addressing fraud. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. So maybe we, we took a very large picture view. So maybe now we can get into some of the details, right? Associated with auditor responsibility for fraud and auditor difficulty in detecting fraud. Um, you know, AS2401 specifically tells auditors that management has a unique ability to per perpetrate fraud because it is frequently in a position to directly or indirectly manipulate the accounting records. And the SEC um, in, uh, enforcement actions and the PCOB inspections often find insufficient auditor skepticism, um, particularly when it comes to areas of management integrity management override. So I'd like to ask you, Charlie, in your work doing um, investigations of fraud, um, what suggestions do you have for developing um, and enhancing auditor skepticism in these areas where there are um, opportunities for management override and um, violations of the internal control? Yeah, no, it's a very, it's a very good point, and uh, I don't know that I have a silver silver bullet answer. Uh, you know, there's these old things where they would take young kids and put them in prison for a while, the scared straight type of thing. Uh, to me, the the best auditor is the one that's actually been involved in the situation where they weren't skeptical enough, and everything fell apart, and and fraud was exposed, and you know. They'll probably never be an auditor again because they won't be allowed to be. But the reality is their perspective is now where it should be, which is they're now totally skeptical. The client that they thought was their buddies in a way that becomes their worst enemy. And that, how do you get that mindset in the auditors? This is really the difference between a regular auditor and a forensic auditor. The forensic auditor questions everything, doesn't accept management representations. We actually build into the audit process representations for management. We, it's, it's the auditor is supposed to accept them. So there is this, you know, constant friction between accepting the representations of management and stepping and, and, and not. Uh, I would say that instead of discovering fraud, you'll often see auditors simply either decline in engagement or the resign from the engagement. And when that happened, it's often because the auditor gets to the point where they say, we can no longer accept representations from management. 
but it isn't done in a way that exposes fraud. But that is the way the auditor often addresses the situation where they feel uncomfortable enough that they no longer feel like they can do the audit um, because of their, their concerns. So I'm not really helping to except to just say, I think, you know, this is a very difficult area, whether you, whether you have to train it into the auditors, I'm not sure. Um, I do think it's helpful going back to what we talked about earlier to find ways to align the auditor with the investor community, have them identify that that's their job, not to work with management, which is, again, this is the reality of what happens during the audit process. Okay, thank you for that comment. Um, Steve, I want to turn to you because one of the problems that exists with auditor skepticism often is that auditors are in, in the work papers and um, for, for some of the cases that you've worked on, and certainly in the experimental audit literature shows that auditors are pretty good at assessing the risk of misstatement related to fraud. However, there's a disconnect between auditors detection and auditors action. Um, oftentimes it's junior auditors who are being placed in the forefront of the assignment because of the way the audit model model works as that apprenticeship model that you might have a junior auditor who actually detects a problem but is unable or not you know well supervised and directed to detect that problem and take it to fruition so Stephen if you could share with us some examples and lessons learned from the cases that you've prosecuted yes thank you um well, part of it is an apprentice model. I think the majority of it is the audit firm's incentive is to do the audit as cheaply as possible. And so the more junior person they can put on there to spend time, then they can spread people around and do multiple audits and make more money. And the examples we see um, are exactly what you said. For example, in one of our cases within the last six years, um, there was a several billion dollar transaction and the person on the ground auditing it was an intern. Um, not even, a, not even a, hadn't done anything yet as, as an auditor. Uh, and that intern did audited the transaction, wrote it up, passed it up the chain. Um, some people, everyone said they didn't read it. Somebody I'm sure read it up the chain, but that even that intern identified that there was probably something wrong here, but no one else looked at it. And it turned out to be the nub of the fraud. Um, we see repeatedly as well that if a junior auditor does identify something, the ability to get people above that junior auditor to spend time on it and pay attention is very difficult. And in fact, the first case that I ever tried was against a mid-tier accounting firm and our star witness was a former um, junior auditor who had identified a significant conflict of interest between the partner uh, who was in charge at this mid-tier accounting firm uh, and the client took it up the chain and ultimately was told to be quiet um, and that conflict of interest, again, was at the nub of what turned out to be a very large fraud. So uh, I think it's just very difficult, as you might imagine, that if you're an inexperienced auditor, to one, understand the complexity of the transactions that often are done, and two, if you do identify something, to be able to get someone above you to even just spend the time to identify it. Um, and one thing Charles said, which, which I thought was good, was, that if you are a if you're a partner and you've been through this and you weren't skeptical, then you know you may be really good next time because and said maybe you're not an auditor again. But that's not been my experience at all. Um, and virtually all of the frauds that I'm de I deal with, unless there is a censure from the PCOB or the SEC, I mean they're not fired. They continue on as auditors. I mean, I'm usually at trial cross-examining them three, four years after the fraud occurred, and there I've yet to have one who wasn't continuing to be an auditor, you know, right then. Um, 
So it's not that they are disciplined in any way unless the PCOB or SEC does something about it. Sometimes they do lose some money and that is an incentive for them. But most of the time, they just keep right on going. Um, I would just say one final thing, which is as far as identifying ways to make them more skeptical, uh, the management rep letter, uh, in my view, should be done away with because I hear it every time, you know, oh, well, the fraudsters gave us a two page letter that said everything was true. And we've always successfully argued that you can't just you know, say, I got a management rep letter, so I don't have to do an audit. You have to follow the rules and do an audit and see evidence, you know, according to the rules. But it's the first thing I always hear. And I, I think that auditors legitimately think that when they get the management rep letter, they're good. So if they if something goes wrong, well, we were lied to, so we don't have to say anything. So I don't, the management rep letter, I think it really works against auditor skepticism. Thank you. So I, I'd like to turn to Andy to hear some insights from his experience, because certainly you were someone who had very close relationships with the auditors, um, Arthur Anderson auditors and Enron, um, where there was a lack of independence. And also um, it appears that the Enron management team was successful in persuading Anderson auditors that there was not an issue of, of um, management integrity. So could you speak to us about indicators that auditors and those who really want to work on the management integrity issue, where should they be plowing deeper? What, what changes we can make in, the, in, in, in auditors response to management integrity challenges or where auditors have shown a lack of independence in their communications and interactions with management. Well, Jennifer, I'm not sure that I have an answer to your question or a solution to the problem to offer, but I'd say this, I think at least in my experience, and Enron was a large company, we were Arthur Anderson's largest client in the world in, in 2000, um, the auditors um, work with the company they consider themselves partners of the company um, uh, as opposed to skeptical outsiders. Um, I think the word that was offered before, I think by Stephen was, uh, you know, skeptical. How do we make them skeptical? Um, look, um, when I, and when I say partners, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, Arthur Anderson did not hesitate to tell us when a transaction violated a rule. We were doing very complex structured finance transactions and they would tell us. But what would typically happen in a situation like that is we would get everyone in a room together, Enron accountants, Arthur Anderson accountants, Enron lawyers, outside lawyers, bankers, everyone's in the finance people all together in a room and we'd just start structuring together until we came up with a way to achieve the company's objectives. And that's why I say, to me, it always felt like Anderson was a partner. Um, they never, uh, they never um, hesitated to tell us when we violated a rule, but then they helped us to get around the intent or the spirit of that rule. Um, I'm not sure that they saw that as the wrong thing to do. I think they saw that as their job, the right thing to do. Now, things have changed quite a bit in 22 years since Enron, but at least at that point in time, um, that's how they saw themselves bringing value to their client. So thank you for that. I think auditors have always been told that they shouldn't be auditing their own numbers. Um, so the auditor being a participant in preparing the financial statements, um, as you described, I think has been a longstanding prohibition, um, even though it's more explicit than SOX. So Charlie, I'd like to turn to you to talk a little bit about, you know, what kind of quality controls can we have within audit firms to prevent some of the issues that we are hearing today, both from Andy and Steven? 
Well, again, I think we're, we're really saying a lot of the same things. Um, the, the issue about the incentives in the system uh, definitely are a problem. And again, I don't think they've, they've been out there. Everyone knows about them, but they just don't get addressed. Uh, so they're still there. There's only so much that you can do internally within a firm if you don't actually address the bigger picture issues. Um, you know, quality controls, I think if you look at the firms, their own policy manuals, they tend to be uh, fairly good. Um, they, they do, I think if there's anything that they've not done well at times is manage risk. Um, because again, these are areas often that are identified as being risk areas in the audits. And um, sometimes they have to do, I say, with I think what is believed ex accepted within an industry is acceptable application of accounting standards. And uh, you know, is there a way to uh, address that? I think if it comes down to the auditors taking a stronger position as to what's not acceptable in face of industry pressure sometimes. Um, and you know, I think that sometimes there's an acceptance of um, risk that is is not tolerable. Um, if you take if you take the financial crisis for example, um, you know because of the bailout by Congress, there really wasn't uh, an, an you know a need to do the autopsy, if you will, of uh, what went wrong there. Uh, but I would say that in, in addition to Anderson, probably there could have been other firms that would have gone under. If it, it actually had done the the, the uh, investigations of what went wrong there, um, but in the end, a lot of it had to do with again the way that the banks were able to use fair value accounting to take what was considered to be difficult to value assets, um, but keep them on the books for longer than they should have been, and uh, until the until the bailout was orchestrated. Um, is this a quality control problem within the firms? I would say it's a quality control problem within the, the whole financial reporting system. Um, but again, we hold the auditors responsible. So, you know, what can be done to address that? Again, a lot of time has been spent trying to fix that kind of problem. Um, and I, I'm kind of to the point where I think that there's only so much you can do within the accounting profession itself. It has to be done holistically and address the whole system. So quality controls doesn't mean that they can't be improved within the firms, um, but we're really talking about fraud. We're not talking about partic any particular standard. Um, and, and the quality control systems, uh, I think have, Im have improved uh, in the last 20 years, um, but I don't think we've actually improved the ability to prevent fraud. Um, and, and again, I, I'm not sure that it's going to be done through just the quality controls at, at the firms. Okay, so so in terms of advice to the board members, any of the panelists and um, thinks that there should be additional uh, standards around the quality control because currently it's pretty much you know self determined by the firms. The, the details of their quality control systems. Do any of the panelists have suggestions or um, specifically relating to penalties that can be imposed on specific auditors? I know when I work on cases um, where there's been you know, auditor negligence, my students, when we read the cases in class, are always disappointed to see the level of penalties imposed against auditors, oftentimes just barring them from uh, practicing before the PCOB again, or you know, limiting fines to dollar amount. Um, so what can we really do in terms of increasing penalty for bad actors? So Shiva, I'll turn to you for some more detailed comments on that. Oh, thank you, thank you, Jennifer. So, uh, so you're right. I mean, if you if you look at the the penalties that the SEC potentially imposes on, say, as I mentioned earlier, CEOs and CFOs and managers, and you compare them to what they do with the audit sector, there's like just, there's not even any comparison, right? It's like it's highly, highly, highly uh, different. Plus, as I said earlier, uh, it's also hard to sue auditors. Because, you know, unless you can show that they actually aided and abetted 
in the fraud. And that will never happen with a established big four type company. Uh, so I think, you know, one, one idea might simply be more disclosure, as I said earlier, you know, if the PCOB could disclose the names of the clients, for instance, uh, that would help the market. Uh, you know, if you could think hard about, uh, you know, there's so much information that gets gathered by the auditor in terms of negotiations with the CFO, none of that actually comes out. We have no idea what the nature of those negotiations really were. The CAM process is helpful for sure. That's why I suggested a letter grade type uh, suggestion, maybe. Uh, and then, you know, I just want to see what they've done. So, as I said earlier, if there was some process by which I can actually look at the work papers and figure out how they decided what they decided, none of that is transparent. It's a complete black box. And it is kind of ironic because this is an industry that polices transparency and yet they are never transparent themselves in what they do. Okay, thank you. So um, I'd like to turn our conversation now to, unless there are any other panelists that would like to um, speak further, we've talked a lot about the difficulty in detecting and responding to fraud. And the next topic we wanted to talk about today was auditor communication on fraud and also auditor um, collaboration with the audit committee. Um, so I, I, I throw this question out to all of the panelists to consider what are their thoughts with respect to auditor communication specifically with the, with the um, audit committee? Are audit committees being good stewards of their responsibility in terms of holding auditors accountable for their independence and objectivity in evaluating the, the financial statements and our audit committees really asking the difficult questions of auditors when it comes to issues of uh, fraud and management integrity. Yeah, can I quickly take that Jennifer? Sure. Uh, so, you know, I run a, quite a few, uh, you know, executive training programs for boards. And in my experience, the most audit committees are usually chaired by somebody from the big four or an ex-CFO. And frankly, in my experience, the others simply delegate their decision rights to this individual because they get really intimidated by gap, gas. You know, it's just so technical. They say, look, you know, let, let the chair figure this out. And then, so many of the, and I actually run a quiz, you know, elementary accounting concepts, the, the quiz that you would probably give an entering undergrad class. You know, they, at most, they get probably 50% of that right. Many of these folks don't know the difference between an asset, a liability, and expense, and income. It's, uh, so, so in my experience, in practice, the, the, the chair, which is usually an ex big four type person has more decision rights than he or she should have in an ideal world. Um, so, so when, when, when people consider how audit committees interact with auditors, I'd urge them to keep at least this, you know, limited fact in mind. It's clearly my experience is limited. It's a small sample, but it's something to think about. Thanks. So thank you. Um, you gave us some anecdotal evidence from from your experience with with um, audit committee members. Charlie, um, what are your thoughts on the matter? Well, I think you know the cases, for example, that Stephen was talking about. Every time that the auditor was not doing their job, uh, every time that they failed for whatever reason, they were doing it for the least amount of money possible. I'm curious what the audit committee, what it's like for that particular company. My guess, it was a very weak audit committee. Yeah, this goes to the incentives. If the auditor thinks they're working for the, for an audit committee, they're going to view it differently than they are when they're working for management. Unfortunately, I think there are plenty of, there's really good audit committees out there. There's no question. Um, I see them, I work with them. But there's also audit committees, I'm afraid, that are still, think their best, their, their job is to, is to lower the audit fee. Um, and unfortunately that still exists today. That may be outside the purview of the PCOB, but it's a very important part of this. And to the extent the PCOB can, 
help to drive the communications um, with audit committees, that's only one way. The audit committee has to be receptive to those communications and they have to actually do a good job for standing up for the auditor, uh, especially when management is doing things they should do. The auditors can evaluate that situation quite readily. And if they see that the, the audit committee is not going to stand up to them, then they're less likely to stand up to management. So it doesn't mean it's right, but I, I think this is a very important area uh, that may again go outside the purview of the PCOP. Thank you. Go ahead, Stephen. Um, I, I like to say that the clearer the rules are and relate directly to the audit committee, the better it is. Because certainly both of what my colleagues just said is accurate. And often when you have a former big four person who is the chairman of the audit committee, um, this happened again within the last, just, just pre COVID where that chair, former big four chair of the audit committee stated that it wasn't the auditor's job to find fraud, right? So guess what? That audit committee didn't do a very good job, right? And this is very recent history. So it's not like, you know, this was 20 years ago. Um, so I think something that makes very clear what the auditor's responsibility are in their communications with the audit committee is helpful because I, I've yet to find an audit committee that actually really understood what an auditor's job was. And I would say the perception overall of the accounting community and their continued, you know, trying to limit their responsibility to find fraud, um, it still permeates the profession. So, you know, it was, we've never actually lost this issue since 2005. We've convinced every judge, every jury, every arbitrator that it's the auditor's job to find fraud based on the standards, but somehow auditors have now been able to argue for the, this entire time, 20 something years, that they it's not their job. So I would say a standard that makes as clear as possible that they're supposed to design their audit to detect fraud. Um, and they need, the audit committee needs, they need to communicate to the audit committee what their risk and findings are would be helpful in this regard. Because like I said a few minutes ago, even if you're interning at the SEC and you say it's not, your reward, you make partner at the big four. So thank you for that. Um, in the interest of time, we wanna allow um, the board members as well as the members of the IAG to ask questions, but I'd like each of you to, you know, we, we our discussion was quite broad and we certainly talked a lot about the fundamental larger problem that requires way more stakeholders than the PCOB itself. The PCOB board is operating within the confines of, of SOX and the, and the legislation, which has certain prohibitions on privacy and disclosure of information. And so let's, you know, I'd like us to use this opportunity to see what specific advice you would give to the board members who are in attendance today about, you know, possible changes that can occur from a standard setting perspective, um, turning to audits inspections. That's something that the board has great latitude with respect to their inspections and incentives that they can establish to hold auditors uh, accountable. So I'd like to throw it out to all of the panelists to offer suggestions to the board. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah, look, I, I think in some ways the PCOB is best positioned to address any flaws in the, we're dealing with fraud, any of the standards are applicable. I mean, they're all applicable to this issue. Um, depending on the circumstances, it, could, it may come into play. When it comes to the weakness in the standards, the PCOB has the best tool available to it, which is its own information it cleans from the inspections and its enforcement processes. Where are the problems? Where are the issues that need to be addressed? Where are the weaknesses in the standard? That becomes the basis for the for the improvement in it. Beyond that, I think it is something that's important. It helps the auditor to, to be very exact, what Stephen was talking about in communications, making it clear what their responsibilities are, and also making clear 
um, you know, where did they draw the line? I'm a little worried about that because of something that was said earlier, D David had said that, you know, you also become then the reason why there's a problem because we complied by the, by the rules, but it, it didn't actually go far enough. So I think you have to be very careful in, in how those are crafted. But again, I think the PCLB is in the best position to know where the weaknesses are that need to be addressed in the standards. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Um, Andy, you're up next. Okay, thank you. Um, I would uh, like to make two suggestions. The first, I'd like to echo uh, Stephen's comment about uh, creating potential financial losses for the accounting firms if they do not detect fraud. And that would apply to either the explicit fraud or the gray area fraud. But uh, to make them more liable, um, then their whole mindset would change uh, with regard to how do we protect the firm from a catastrophic lawsuit. Um, and the second thing is I would um, maybe rethink PCAOB 203, which, um, uh, and I'll, I'll paraphrase in layman terms, it basically says, if you follow generally accepted accounting standards, you should assume that in nearly every instance, your financial statements will not be misleading. And I, I, I could assume, infer why that rule was put in place, maybe as an incentive um, to companies not to depart from GAAP, but I would reword it to say just the opposite, that you should not assume that if you follow the standards, that inevitably your financial statements are not misleading. I would, I think it gives them an out by having PCAOB 203. They get the fall back on the rules, even though the Second Circuit Court of Appeals said that rule, you know, you can't rely on rules as your defense in fraud. I think accountants, auditors do rely on that. That's their mindset. So I would rethink that rule. Okay, thank you. Um, any of the other panelists? Uh, Stephen, you're up next. This is a place where I think Andy and I differ a little bit, which is I tell the juries at the beginning of every trial if the auditor complied with the rules and didn't find the fraud, rule for them. Um, I mean, that's what we tell the jurors. And the reason I tell them that is because in every case, they don't come close to complying with the rules. I mean, our experience is that, you know, the rules are actually pretty good. Like, yes, I want you to make it even more clear that it's their job to find fraud, right? But I haven't had trouble convincing anybody besides an auditor that it's their job to find fraud, right? Because the rules say it. So I, you know, I, I think that if we could just get them to comply with the rules, that would be a huge step. And I understand Andy's concerns and it makes perfect sense to me. Um, and maybe that's the next generation. But in the first instance, I mean, let's just give them an incentive to actually do an audit because I don't see any audits, right? I, I see in all of these frauds, not just one, two. I mean, we find numerous violations and gross violations of the rules every time. I mean, it's gotten to the point now that people want me to investigate the audit. And I say, I can, if you want to know whether you have a good case or not, but I can tell you there's going to be numerous violations of the rules because there are every time because their incentive is not to do a great audit. So I know they're not going to do one. Um, so I would say back to your question, the, the things that could help are what you've already heard. You know, let's make it clear it's their, time, their job to detect fraud. Let's increase the penalties on the individual partner who's got the incentives. And let's increase the penalties on the firms through transparency. I mean, I think that was a really terrific point. I mean, your whole job is to make things transparent. But when it comes to you, nothing's transparent. Uh, that doesn't seem right. Thank you. Okay, so at this point, I would like I would um, like to open questions, and we first would like to invite the board members, um, Chair Williams, and the other board members to ask questions of the panel. Uh, this is Kara Stein. How are you? Uh, this has been a great panel. I'm thinking a little bit about what was alluded to at the beginning about 
I, we hear regularly about short sellers um, detecting fraud. Um, most recently, I'm thinking about Wirecard. Um, should auditors be doing more of the same analysis, especially given the increased use of data analytics? I don't know if anybody has any thoughts regarding that. So I can, I'll take that because uh, I, I was probably the one who made that comment. Uh, you know, I, I, so, so two questions here. I'm always curious about what kind of R and D budgets do audit firms have, right? So if you're a, if you're, if you're any kind of company in the U S and if you don't have a good R and D budget, you're going to go out of business. And I'm curious to figure out what that is for an audit firm and why, of course, they won't go out of business because they have a mandate as we discussed. The second, it's less ability. They're very smart, right? In terms of, uh, say, helping companies with consulting advice and so on, it's incentives. So the short seller makes money if he or she is right. The auditor probably loses market share if, if, they, are, if they do what the short seller did and discovered the fraud. So unless we fix that, it's less, some of it is R&D, I would argue, but most of it is incentives. Thank you. Um, board member Thompson, did I see that you were? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so I want to circle back to the discussion about uh, the apprenticeship model and how it kind of defines the, you know, the profit margin and the business model in the sense that you send a lot of first year, second year um, auditors out to do the heavy lifting. Uh, and then I'm thinking about if that's foundational, uh, to uh, the company uh, getting a uh, good audit or having a, a good audit, uh, how is that working in the environment when there is no uh, very little ability to have over-the-shoulder training, uh, over-the-shoulder engagement with uh, more senior uh, uh, members of the firm to include the partners? And, uh, you know, I hear, you know, several discussions around this thing. It's not an impact, but, you know, I know how I was trained uh, coming up uh, in the accounting, finance, and, and the uh, uh, world. And a lot of that was, was assimilating through just being close to someone with more experience. So, again, uh, just wondering how that is, is impacting the aspect of, of fraud if you're not getting that in-person uh, opportunity. Thank you, Board Member Thompson. Um, any of the panelists would like to respond directly to that? I can say from the academic front that there are many academics who are concerned about this matter, and there are concurrently several research studies that I'm aware of where people are looking at how do you develop expertise in a remote environment as well as the difficulty, some of the difficulties that you've raised, because auditors are now no longer in the room, you know, observing uh, senior auditors and managers. They're not getting the opportunity to overhear questions and discussions that they normally would have when they sit um, in that audit room. Okay, so I see several members of the IAG have questions, but before, again, um, before we turn it over to those members, I just want to know if there are any other um, board members who would like to ask questions. Okay, so next I will move. I'm, I, I'm not sure the order um, in which questions were raised, but I can see the hands on my screen. So I will start with you, Hal. You pop up first for me. Okay. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I want to build off of Stephen's comment about there was no incentive to do a good audit. And I want to tie that in with what Shiva was saying about an insurance model. He just very briefly touched on adopting some type of insurance model. And I was intrigued by that. So I've, I've a lot of questions, but I'm going to see if I can just hit on three very high level questions. What do you see as the prospects or roadblocks to a model like that being adopted? If you if you believe that we cannot develop incentives to do good audits, then is there a way to change the business model to, to get those incentives? Um, how much capital would you need 
to run an insurance model um, instead of the current model that we have today, because there's virtually no capital backing the accounting firms. So how much capital would you need? Um, what risk would you be insuring? Would you be insuring fraud or would you be insuring um, restatement risk? I, I view those as very different risk. I'd be interested in any thoughts there. And then, uh, so those are my three questions. What roadblocks, what prospects do you see for adopting an insurance model? What capital, what amount of capital would you need to back an insurance model? And um, what risk would you actually be insuring, fraud or restatement? Well, thank you, Al. I'm, I'm happy you like that uh, suggestion. So I've talked to lawyers and they're actually interested, but somebody has to, you know, put in the hard work and trying to figure these out. And I'm happy to do it. I've never found anybody interested in the idea, so I've never pursued it. But but coming back to your point, what what might me be insuring? But there are already parallels, right? The whole DNO insurance contract model is not that different, right? I mean, you're basically insuring uh, directors at some level against, uh, I mean, if you actively aid in a bet, obviously the insurance doesn't work for you. So something along those lines would be the first place to kind of begin thinking. And if, if you need more capital, perhaps that's the right economic price of an audit. So we shouldn't shy away from capital. Maybe it is expensive to run a good audit. And perhaps the numbers we are seeing now are, are arguably deflated, either because we have a global mandate and we're spreading costs or, or we're cross-selling and so on. So the capital and the economic price doesn't bother me. And if the audits become too expensive, as I said earlier, you know, there's self-selection in the market and at least the numbers are out. And, you know, a lot of these perverse incentives about, you know, who hires an auditor, who does the auditor work for, who does the auditor think his or her bosses go away in this in this other world. So, you know, so, so I hope that responds to you a little bit. Yeah. Shiva, I, I think that what I'm hearing from you is there'd be some work that needs to be done on this. I would encourage the PCOB to consider it, you know, working on some type of white paper and said, look, we, we recognize that some of these incentives in the existing system don't work. Here's an alternative. And I think by having that discussion, having a contrasting alternative, that may suggest to you, as you were suggesting, here's the real cost of an audit. Why are audits not costing this? And therefore, what are we doing wrong? We can either adopt an insurance model, and I know that would require Congress and others to be involved, but maybe that's a way to really help frame the discussion to go forward. And I would really encourage the board members to look at that, involve you. I'm happy to participate in that discussion. Uh, I covered the insurance industry for a long time. Uh, I think there are a lot of merits to that in terms of pay structure, capital backing, the guarantees, if you will, the audits themselves. I think there are a lot of merits to that discussion. So I'll leave it there, but I encourage the board to consider. Thank you, Al. And you know, you know where to find me if you need. Thank you very much. So um, I see in, in the queue, I see Nemet, Parveen, and Lynn. So starting off with you, Nemet. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, uh, and I, I agree with many of the views shared by the panelists. And of course, auditors should face some responsibility for uh, fraud perpetrated by issuers. Uh, I think that the big issue is the incentive problem, you know, who is the auditor's boss. But to this point, I would say the PCOB, particularly with its inspection program, has made significant strides in helping align auditor incentives uh, with more investors. This is, of course, work to be done, but it, I'd like to say that that, that, that helps. Uh, a sentiment that I look echo more in the, in the last panel is the idea that uh, disclosure of, of audit work papers and more information about the inputs that go into, into conducting an audit, see, after a cooling off period has, has passed, right? Could be five years, could be longer, uh, but that disclosure actually can be very, very helpful uh, for, for, again, reasons that I can, I can go over later. Uh, but the, the two points that, uh, you know, why I think there's at least more nuance in the argument uh, is how much of the, like, as we shift responsibility, more responsibility towards the auditors, I'd like to make the point that auditors do face substantial litigation risk, and, and this is evident in their fees. Uh, audit fees for firms with public equity is about 20 to 22% higher than audit fees for private firms with public debt, uh, 
uh, that are otherwise similar in, in, in many, many respects from size to complexity to other, other things. Uh, so steps that would further increase litigation risk that auditors face uh, can lead to even higher audit fees and could really benefit lawyers at the expense of investors. And that's just something to be mindful, I think, as, as additional proposals are considered. Uh, and one other point I'd, I'd like to make is just the idea of introducing additional competition in the audit markets uh, when auditors' incentive is to do the audit as cheaply as possible, uh, I think, as, as Stephen said, uh, can, does negatively affect audit quality. Uh, I realize that this is counterintuitive, but as long as audit quality to some degree is unobservable, which I think it is, uh, increasing competition in the audit market can have negative effects. Thank you. So, so thank you for those comments, Nemeth. And from your comments, I hear opportunity to loop back to Saba's um, engagement in discussions with investors, because ultimately investors are the ones responsible for paying the cost for a high quality audit. If investors don't show strong willingness to, to, to you know, shoulder the burden of audit fees, then they're gonna get the quality of audits that they're, they're paying for. And maybe investors are willing to make um, the trade-off that, you know, the risk exposure that they, that they currently have for lower quality audits. Maybe that's the case. So um, knowing that we're coming up at 2.45, our session ends, I'd like to move um, quickly to Parveen and then to Lynn Turner. Uh, I just want to say, Jennifer, thank you. And I think uh, panelists have given a very detailed overview of the problems and some of the suggested solutions. So without repeating them, I want to make one underlying point and follow up with the question. The underlying point here is, and we have discussed in our subcommittee also, the basic job of an audit is to install trust, faith, and confidence. And I think very early on, we heard in this uh, discussion from David that, uh, you know, are auditors really serving the interests of the creditors and the investors? I wonder if any thought has been given because lots of solutions have been proposed, problems continue to permeate from the last 30, 40, 50 years, and we keep writing finer standards, but we still cannot bring the, the, the um, uh, mouse in the trap, so to say. Uh, has any thought been given to designate the auditors now as fiduciaries, just like we do the board of directors, because the purpose of doing that is to really encompass all the other things that we cannot hold them accountable for, and that one word could redefine the relationship of the auditors with the investors. I'd like to hear what panelists uh, on the fraud panel think about that. That if the idea is that they are fiduciaries to investors, I like that. Obviously, they should be in many ways adverse to their clients because they're supposed to be looking for fraud. Um, I mean, we emphasize that you know the Supreme Court has defined auditors as the public watchdog, and the actual ethical rules for auditors state that they owe a public duty because the financial markets, the public, you know, rely upon them. So I, I don't think it's a very big step to say that they owe a fiduciary duty based on their own ethical standards and the Supreme Court, you know, statement that they're a public watchdog. Okay, thank you, uh, Lynn. Yeah, three questions for the three panelists. Um, first, Raj, you mentioned the insurance thing, and of course, this has been floated, you know, over the past couple of decades by one of your peers at New York University. Uh, it, it was floated while I was still chief accountant. I had a chance to talk to him, but I found he'd never discussed it with an insurance company to see if they'd done it, at least not at, at that time frame. I've subsequently had a chance to talk to two of the insurance companies that would be big enough and with enough capital to do it, but they have indicated they have no interest in exposing themselves to that risk through an insurance policy. 
especially since they could be looking at billion dollar plus uh, settlements. Have you had a question for you and then I'll move on and then you can all respond. One, if you discuss the feasibility of this with an insurance company who has the capital and the wherewithal and would be interested in doing it. Second question is uh, for Charlie. Charlie, as you know, GAP, uh, GAS specifically says that the auditor has to consider whether or not there's any information that's necessary for an understanding of the financial statements that hasn't been disclosed. And if that's the case, then the auditor couldn't give the opinion that the financial statements are fairly presented. Yeah. Uh, and the SEC, the security laws going back to 33 and 34 have similar language that says uh, if there's information omitted or misstated that uh, you need to understand uh, the financial statements and not make them misleading to the re reader, then that information has to be in the uh, financial statements as, as well. You talk about your concern about the accounting standards, yet those two catch-all standards should, in principle, as a principle, should uh, result in that information showing up in the financial statements. And this is a question also for Andy, because he's aptly teed this up as well. Why do we never get that information out of the auditors and uh, why don't we ever see any, quite frankly, why don't we see anything where the enforcement agencies are enforcing those rules which are already uh, on the, on the uh, books? And the last question for all three of you focused so, on. So I'm sorry, Lynn, but if we could just quickly, because Saba is reminding us that we are ending at 245. So okay. if we could Go ahead. quickly have um, perhaps Charlie can give his response and, and then maybe if we have time, David, we can get your question, at least on the record. I'll, I'll be, I'll be quick. Uh, Lynn, look, you raised an excellent point. Um, disclosure is a, it's been, we do a poor job of, of disclosure actually in the United States and, and outside the United States as well, for that matter. Uh, but I just focus on the United States. And problem, the real problem when it comes to disclosure is the arguments over materiality and what's material. And there's not been much done. And really, this is probably something that the SEC needs to focus on in order to get this addressed. Um, but it's an outstanding issue. Thank you. And David, you have the final word and one minute to do so. Yeah, I, I, look, I thought the discussion was really good. I, I speak as a someone who in my former life was lead plaintiff in the in the Parmalat fraud. But I just would wonder whether we need to be careful about the balance in all of this, that, that we want the auditor to be on the side of the investor and on the side of the PCOB and what it is that they're doing, rather than to feel threatened by more and more and more rules. And I wonder whether there are things we can think about in the systems of audit. I mean, a Cara, for a men for example, mentioned getting the external data on this, um, a, a, of whether there's a problem with the company. Do the auditors all look at what are their most threatened companies, particularly those that, that are ones where there might be a question about going concern because that's when we're going to have losses. It's not just the price is going to be wrong of the shares. It is that that, that people are going to be have losses. Are they sharing those with the PCOB so that the PCOB could actually help give leverage to them in being able to make sure that the right thing uh, uh, is put out? And um, I don't know whether in the States, the, uh, the audit companies are for specific boards with external members uh, who oversee the audit within the company. Might that be something which again, gave them leverage to be able to do uh, their job properly and to challenge more. Are they ever asked in Andy's question about, well, what are the rules that people are using that might not be uh, helping us get a, a true and fair view? And I wonder whether there's those sorts of things that might be encouraged through the system and whether they might address some of the very, very, very real problems 
um, that our speakers on the panel have so very realistically been talking about. Thank you very much, David, and thank you to everyone. Um, I, I turn it over to Saba to take us into our break. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you very much to all our panelists. This was a great, great discussion, and we'll be sure to continue it. So more on that later from Amy and I will be in touch regarding next steps. We'll take a quick break and be back here at 3 p.m. promptly. So thank you. See you soon.